Hello, I'm Doug, and this is a longer introduction into Bell's Future Quantum Mechanics, a novel interpretation. But before I get too long-winded, let's see if I can summarize it in just two sentences. Bell's inequality, backed by experimental evidence, shows that quantum mechanics must be non-local, thus the wave function is space-like separated from the observer at the origin. The product of the wave function and its conjugate provide the odds of an interaction with the observer happening here, 0, 0, 0, in the future. Let's get some historical background. In 1935, Einstein, Poldolsky, and Rosen proposed that local variables hidden in the past light cone could explain how quantum mechanics worked. They claimed inherent uncertainty in quantum mechanics could be traded to something more real, like variables that are hidden. It was not so easy to dismiss the proposal, particularly given Einstein's stature. It took until the 1960s when John Bell found an inequality that could test if variables are hidden in the past light cone, or these entangled states of quantum mechanics were somehow actually real because quantum information actually is non-local. Now, if one asks the same question the same way, well, both models make identical predictions. But if the questions are asked at slightly different angles, then the hidden variables theory is unchanged. Quantum mechanics says that the correlations with, uh, of measurements should actually become stronger. A huge experimental effort went on from the 80s until even today to try and confirm that there wasn't some some flaw in any of the designs, but the results were always the same. That quantum mechanics is non-local and that hidden variable models are wrong. All right, so my own belief is that all that ever happens is in three dimensions of space and one for time. Einstein put Lorentz transformation to great use to solve all kinds of problems um, in physics, particularly electromagnetism. It was his math professor who recognized Einstein was actually doing rotations not just in space, but in space-time. And you might be a little put off by uh, the fact that I'm referring to a deity here, but the word choice was made because it is my belief that all of physics, both what is currently known, which is absolutely enormous, and that which is not known, well, it still has to live in three dimensions of space and one for time. And I am more concerned, like really, with why parody doesn't work for beta decay than anything that might be uh, biblical, okay? Notice how those three spatial dimensions are written explicitly in the space-time graph. Starting from studies that were done with five dimensions in the 20s, researchers, particularly in the 70s uh, to today, created a significant investigation into higher uh, spatial dimensions. I believe that all such work will have no lasting value. More recently, people have been championing a, a, a multiverse so there's more than one space-time. And I again believe that a multiverse will have no lasting value. So you might say I'm kind of a radically conservative uh, circa 1960, because in the 1960s, if I said, well, there are only three, three dimensions of space and there's one universe, they would have said, yeah. <laughs> it's not the way we are, to, not the way we are today. Uh, so I'm a little old school in that way. Uh, oh, I'm really old, uh, a 1908 uh, radical um, 
I, I, I got to bring up this tangent. It's not central to uh, this Bell's future quantum mechanics, but I figure, you know, while, while you're bringing things in for repairs, you might as well uh, just go for it. Um, I, I'm a 1908 Minkowski radical. Uh, what he wrote back in the day was, uh, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. If an event in space-time is just a bag of numbers, you know, a four-vector uh, with hardly any structure at all, uh, then actually it's okay to ask if the bag can be expanded to higher dimensions uh, like people have done. But if an event is just one number, uh, the bag actually can't be expanded. I mean, it's just a number. And I think it's even hard for me to hold that idea of thinking of an event as one number, even though it, I always say, yeah, but it's really got time and three dimensions of space. Um, and there is a, a type of number with this property, and it is called a quaternion. In summary, space-time is everything we know and everything we do not know all on the very same stage. So let's think about Sir Isaac Newton and classical physics. It's kind of odd, but uh, most of space-time gets subtracted away uh, for Newtonian physics. And that's because space is absolute, time is absolute, and there's no way to rotate space into time. And we deal with such tiny, tiny velocities, you know, 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 10. Um, it's experience, the physics we experience every day. But then comes along the work of Einstein uh, with his relativistic physics in an effort to understand electromagnetism. And that opens up um, the whole space-time graph. Uh, but I'm actually going to focus in on uh, causality. And when you do that and you say, okay, what can change here now? The only things that can change here now must be in the past light cone. And that's why I kind of grade out the space-time regions, because those space-time regions cannot cause what's happening here now. And now we wonder, well, where do I draw quantum mechanics? I mean, what do I subtract away to just say, I'm just doing quantum mechanics? And I don't know if there really is a widely accepted answer to that. They just say, well, we're in quantum and we don't get what's going on. <laughs> Which is unfortunate. Let's see if we can uh, change that. Um, so, so this is my proposal about Bell's future quantum mechanics. So. So here's the line I want to quote. Each element may only be influenced by events which are located in the backward light cone of its point in space-time. These claims are found on the assumption about nature that constitutes what is known now as local realism. It was that clause only influenced by events that are located in the backward light cone that caused, caught my attention. I had actually been thinking about the wave functions as being space-like for a, a, a bit of time. But if there are no hidden variables, as shown by experiments, well, why don't we just remove any possibility of those local events causing, um, influencing quantum experiments. Notice how Einstein's causality and Bell's future uh, quantum mechanics combine to cover all of space-time. Both relativity and quantum mechanics were born and matured in the same window, and at least in the case of Einstein, <laughs> in the very same brain. Uh, now we've got to actually repeat this. Uh, exercise for tangent spaces. Uh, so space-time records 
where, when things are. Location, location, location. Space-time formally has no information about change. Change lives in tangent spaces. Which tangent space uh, you, you, you decide to use determines what change is under study. The most common one is energy momentum. And the tangent space can also be broken up in the same force types. You can have all, classical, uh, relativistic, and quantum. Imagine one were to study the classical motion of a rock. There would be an energy and momentum at the point in space where the rock happened to be, and everywhere else in space-time, the energy and momentum would be zero. And these zeros are usually ignored, so the topic of tangent spaces usually doesn't show up till graduate school. And, you know, it makes this switch to continuous fields seem kind of mystical. Instead, the difference between the two is more like a discrete versus continuous uh, values for energy momentum. Now, physicists have dis studied all combinations of the base space with the tangent space. So there's both classical and relativistic quantum mechanics. And I guess I'm going to go into this uncool sidebar. Um, I, uh, the base space is the base. Uh, all right, so the base space, space-time, uh, cannot be changed by anything. At least that's my opinion about what's going on. Uh, I appreciate that it, uh, this clear statement will be violently rejected by those who have made the serious study of Einstein's general relativity. Tens of, tens of thousands of times um, it has been repeated. Gravity bends space-time. I know I've heard it a lot. <laughs> I'm not in denial that those words exist and that there's serious backing behind them. But I do feel compelled to at least question the link between the words and the math. Gravity alters tangent space of space-time, as seen by all the dt's and dr's in metric solutions. Space-time has Lorentz symmetry, and it has an origin. Gravity and energy momentum have Poincaré symmetry, and you know the the origin really is it's an affine space, so that's it's kind of like you're getting rid of the origin. Now, if you sum up all the changes in all the tangent spaces, the result is a curved path in space-time. But all the change happens in the tangent space. We should be saying that the tangent space is curved and then summed, not that the base space is curved. And I feel I need to do that because space-time has to be shared by all branches of physics and it's sharing exactly the same thing where when nothing else and it's only when you go into different tangent spaces that you get different physics let me explain the difference between a momentum and a momentum state where I use momentum in the relativity chart, but momentum state in the um, Bell's future quantum mechanics. Well, momentum from the past light cone can change the motion of an observer at the origin. The entire chain of events leading to that change of the observer can be known in theory, if not in practice. A space-like momentum state is different. Momentum states can never change an observer at the origin here now. The precise odds of a momentum state changing the momentum of, a, of an observer can be calculated. In the future, if an interaction does occur, it will change the path of the observer in the usual expected way. The entire chain of events leading to this momentum change 
cannot be known because they are space-like separated. The observer is necessarily blindsided by a momentum state. The same story applies to energy versus an energy state. Observers can absorb energy from the past like cone and heat up. Observers cannot absorb an energy state because it is just too far away. They can, in the future, absorb the energy to the same heating up effect. And we can calculate the odds. The wave function is a set of space-like energy momentum states. Each state may not have a time-like relationship to the observer at the origin, here now. Each state of the wave function can have a time-like relationship to other states within the same wave function. Light-like relationships have not been addressed at this moment, as, is, as that is a refinement uh, one will have to include with some care at a later time. For a complex valued wave function, the conjugate is simple to construct as a mathematical exercise. The product of a wave function and its conjugate evaluates to a positive real number. If properly normalized, the positive number is the odds of an interaction happening. Nothing unusual is happening under Bell's future interpretation. All calculations will be the same. Of course, I'm not completely happy with complex value uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, there's something I call dull quaternion series quantum mechanics. Quaternion quantum mechanics actually has been studied and presented in a book-length form by Stephen Adler. And the topic was commented on in a December 2018 uh, blog by Scott Aronson, where he came to the conclusion that Quaternion quantum mechanics was a complete dumpster fire because it would allow superliminal transfer of information. Well, I got to agree. Any algebraic system that allows for superluminal tr uh, transforma transformation of information is kind of boring and uh, actually deserves no further study. Uh, but I was really kind of surprised uh, that this flaw was actually known to Adler uh, as, as he admitted in an email correspondence with the Aronson. And I didn't pick it up in the book. <laughs> uh, but I had a rapid exchange uh, with Aronson. Uh, he's a very, very bright fellow. Um, and I, as I was doing that, I came up with the idea of what I call point one way uh, quaternions. Um, because if you pick an arbitrary direction uh, and stick to it, like in each and every calculation you do, uh, it'll work, right? In fact, Aronson's such a bright guy, he said, yeah, sure, it would work. Uh, he, he just thought it was so dull as an idea that, that it didn't even deserve a new name. And you can't really argue with that. <laughs> uh, but I went back and I thought about it some more. And I thought a better name would be Point with Precision. Because in the lab, physicists, physics experiments are, are renowned for the precision that they use uh, with their experimental apparatus. It is common to use tables that isolate vibrations from the surroundings to in, when doing the experiment. Uh, and the precision of location known at the bench is just being applied to the math used. Quaternions that point in the same direction commutes. A quaternion series actually that I was using is not a division algebra like the quaternions are. Instead, it's a semi-group with inverses. And the reason that you do that sort of thing is, is because you can have two quaternion series that are orthogonal to each other. And we know you need that sort of thing in order to do all kinds of calculations 
in quantum mechanics. So for quaternion value wave functions, the conjugate now has a physical meaning instead of just being like a math thing. So it really is time and x, y, and z, or energy and px, py, pz, and the conjugate is the mirror reflection in space. And then you form the product of the wave function with its mirror reflection and you're going to get a here future value. Here is zero, 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 and the future is a positive real number. And again, if you properly normalize it, the real value is the odds of seeing uh, an interaction. So it is actually this simple physical interpretation of an otherwise abstract notion, complex numbers, whatever, um, that really means that, I, that that's my motivation for going into it. The Bell's future quantum mechanics interpretation in no way depends on quaternion series, quantum mechanics, passing all of the many, many hurdles it has to um, as a viable algebraic approach to doing calculations but I'm motivated by the physical aspect of it. So there, there have got to be like about 20 or more interpretations of quantum mechanics. And nearly all of them make the same predictions uh, like this one does. And I've seen Sean Carroll uh, take a poll of graduate students uh, to find their favorite. And that's just not the way physics works. Physics is a contact sport with only one eventual winner. Physics by subtraction defines areas of studies. Newton's classical physics uses only the axes. Causality in special relativity uses only the past light cone. And by contrast, quantum mechanics uses nothing from the past light cone in this interpretation. Quantum mechanics uses space-like states to calculate the odds of an interaction happening in the future. Bell's future quantum mechanics looks bright. I hope this idea goes viral in a good way. Thank you very much.